talk today is titled Ensemble Control, Steering a Continuum Between Configurations. And this is a work in collaboration with Professor Tim Redman. Thank you very much. All right, uh, what I want you to go home with today is a, a concept called Ensemble Control Theory. Uh, as a, a new and a useful way, we argue, to work with dynamical systems that have some uncertainty. And the thing about this uncertainty is that it has to be bounded within some set. All right, and what I want you to think about is what we are doing is we're steering, instead of steering one system that has an uncertain parameter, we pretend to steer an entire a continuous system, uh, ensemble of systems that have every possible value of that uncertain parameter. So that entire bounded set, we're trying to steer that entire ensemble uh, to the desired area. So let me start with uh, a motivating example. So here is um, a simple differential drive robot. Um, we've got two inputs that we can give to this uh, unicycle type system. Um, we've got uh, U1, which is the forward uh, velocity, so it can move forward or backwards. And then our second input is a turning command, which is U2, so we can turn it to the left or to the right. And so if we want to move this robot from a start position to an in position, uh, that's a solved problem. We can find U1 and U2 as a function of t of time uh, to steer this system you know, from that start to the ending position. That is if we know the wheel size of this robot. So let's just change the system just a little bit um, by adding an epsilon value. Now that epsilon says that you know, we don't really know what that size of the wheel is. To, so to show that, here's this robot again, but it thinks it has a different wheel size. And so now we still want to move this robot from the same start configuration to an ending configuration, but we have this bounded uncertainty. We don't know how big the wheel is, we just know that it's uh, within some bound of a nominal size. So how we solve this problem is we reformulate it. Instead of trying to find out how to steer you know, this robot for a specific unknown parameter, Instead, we talk about trying to steer, steer a continuous ensemble of all these systems that have every possible wheel size from the start to the ending position. Okay. So, you know, a visualization I think would help for that. Um, so, here we go. Uh, here is a uh, a picture of that ensemble. So here we have one robot at the starting position. If I give it a, a forward command and I give that to the entire ensemble, what will happen is the ensemble with the largest wheels are going to go farther than the, you know, the parts of the ensemble with small wheels. And so that ensemble spreads out. If then I give it a turn command, um, what will happen is the, the ensemble with the, the biggest wheels will turn the farthest, the ones with the smallest wheels will turn not as far, and so my ensemble is spreading out. If I tell it to go forward yet again, um, you know, that ensemble spreads out. And I can show you know, the state of the ensemble at you know, different instances of this path. So again, if I start you know, from the beginning, and I move my ensemble forward, you know, I can show the entire ensemble at this discrete instance of time is spread along this line. As I give it a turn command uh, and then send it forward, you know, I can show my entire ensemble at different points. What my goal is, is to move this entire ensemble from a start configuration to an ending configuration uh, and sort of and collapse that entire continuum onto the desired goal position. Right. So the main results that I'm going to talk about today is we're going to show that this system is controllable uh, and then use that result to derive a practical motion planning algorithm um, for actually for moving the continuum. And then I'll validate that with uh, some hardware experiments. One of the things that I want you to remember is the reason why these systems are difficult to work with is because they're infinite dimensional systems. Um, a brief history of you know, where the idea of ensemble control comes from. It comes from the, the physics community where they're trying to manipulate the average quantities 
uh, average properties of a large collection of molecules. So you know, 10 to the 23rd molecules can be represented as sort of a continuum because of the great number. Uh, there's also a lot of great work going on right now in applied mathematics on uh, manipulating the spins of, of molecules for nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy. And so there's good work being done by Brockett, uh, Kinesia, and Lee. But we are roboticists in my group, so we want to know, you know what applications can we make uh, of ensemble control theory towards robotics. So uh, again, staying with our, our system, if we want to take any particular finite dimensional system and prove that it's controllable, uh, what we can do is we can use Chow's theorem. And so uh, what we do is we take our controllable vector fields, which are these G1s, the GI, which where GI goes from 1 to M. But we want to check the rank of this Lie algebra of this group. Uh, and if that Lie algebra has the same rank as the dimension of my configuration space, then the system is controllable, which means that you know, if I want to um, create any arbitrary uh, vector flow for the, my system, I can approximate that. Uh, what this looks like uh, with that uni um, differential drive robot is again we start with the same system of equations where my u1 is my uh, forward velocity and my u2 is my turning command. I express that in a standard form where the forward command is my G1 controllable vector field and my turning command is that G2 controllable vector field. I compute the Lie algebra of that set and when I take the, the Lie bracket of that I get this new controllable vector field G3 which is actually orthogonal to the first two uh, vector fields and since they're all orthogonal I now have the span of my vector fields is now three, which means I can span my entire state space of x, uh, y, and heading. Now, now what that looks like in the real world, um, you know, most of you grew up in cities, so you know how to parallel park a car. We know that no car, you know, not even a smart car, can slide sideways. So the question is, how did it get into that parallel parking spot? Well, what it does is it, it moves forward, you know, turns a little bit, moves backwards, turns again, moves forwards. By concatenating the controllable vector fields, the forwards and the turning commands, we can generate an arbitrary control uh, vector field, even one in the sideways direction, which previously we were not allowed to do. Now, we want to do the same thing as this with our infinite dimensional system, that continuum that I was talking about before. But we have a problem because the state space of our continuum is infinite dimensional. So there's no way that we can create an infinite number of controllable vector fields. However, if we can, uh, following the same you know, motivations in ensemble control theory, if we can take Lie brackets of the controllable vector fields that we can generate, and if we can uh, generate arbitrarily high values of this epsilon parameter, that uncertainty parameter, uh, then we can approximate any given uh, vector flow field. So you say, Aaron, I want you to create a vector flow field from here to here. Uh, and I say, well, I can't give you exactly that, but I can approximate it to any level of, you know, in, to an arbitrary uh, level of approximation. Uh, so we have one caveat that we cannot actually control this differential drive ensemble because the heading is not controllable. If I have a bunch of robots that all have different size wheels and I tell them to turn, um, then the, the angle that they're pointing out will spread out. The farther, the more I tell it to turn, the more that the angles uh, of the continuum spreads out. The only orientation that I can get them all to agree on is if I tell them all to go back um, to heading zero. And so instead I'm going to define a controllable subsystem where I just, uh, as my third state, instead of heading, I just do it as the integral of my turn command. And now this controllable subsystem is fully controllable. And I'll prove that um, by taking Lie brackets again. So I take Lie brackets of this, and since I can generate arbitrarily high values of epsilon, that means that I can approximate um, you know, any continuous function with a polynomial in epsilon. So here, if you give me a vector flow field that you want the ensemble to move in, we can approximate that to arbitrary precision. And as a result, this system is controllable. 
So uh, in order to come up with a, a, mo uh, a path planning from uh, this proof of controllability, what we're going to start with is um, you know, approximate a sinusoid. So we start with our robot facing forward. We tell it to turn, go forward, turn back down, uh, go forward again, and then turn back to the origin. So what's happened is you know, we end up facing the same direction that we were before, but we've moved some distance in the x and in the y uh, direction. So we can express that um, in actually acute form. Um, where we've moved some a, direct, a distance in the x and some b direction uh, in the y. And so our, our total change is that delta q as a function of one primitive. Now the nice thing about these is these a's and b's are separable uh, and then we can concatenate these together because I always end up facing the same direction. So I can concatenate uh, these primitives together uh, to form uh, my vector flow field. So if you give me a desired ending coordinates uh, for the ensemble, uh, what I can do is just take the Taylor series about the nominal uh, wheel size. You know, so for my size, it's epsilon equals to one, the nominal value of the wheel. I uh, take the Taylor series of that, and then I can solve for those motion primitives that I need in order to move the ensemble to the desired position. Uh, and here's an example again. Um, these red lines show five specific values of the ensemble, um, where the ensemble is ranging from 1 minus delta to 1 plus delta, and my delta is 20%. So my wheel sizes are from 80% to 120% of nominal value. And I can move it um, from uh, one unit in the x direction, and I can also um, bound the air because I'm doing a Taylor series approximation. So I can bound the air. So I know that this entire ensemble will move um, to the desired coordinate with air that is um, bounded by the number of primitives I have. So here I say I know that the air is bounded by delta raised to the third. So that's uh, exponentially decaying uh, with the number of primitives that I use. The other nice thing that I can do is because I know exactly where those A and B's are in my motion primitives, I know the total distance that any of these robots moved when I was trying to get them to go one unit in the X direction. Uh, and I can actually, I can bound that for, so for any destination within the unit, within a unit square, I know the maximum distance that any of those robots may have gone. And that allows me to do some obstacle avoidance. Um, so here my obstacles are represented by black circles. And I want to move the ensemble from a starting position to a goal position up in the far right-hand corner. Um, however, you know, I, cannot, I do not want to run into, into any obstacles. So what I can do is I can expand a circle until I find the nearest uh, obstacle. And that defines a free area within this unit box that I can uh, move my ensemble along. And I know that the ensemble will never go outside that magenta circle. So let me show you a video of that. So here, I'm expanding my circle that defines a free area that I can go, and I can translate that along my entire path and plan a, a path so that my ensemble never collides with any of my obstacles. Uh, I can also apply this uh, to a real robot. This is this differential drive robot. The nice thing about uh, differential drive robots is that if I change the wheel radius, and here are four different wheel radiuses that go from 80% to 120% of the nominal value. Um, and if I, so I can, if I give this as an epsilon value of the size of the wheel, that actually scales my forward velocity and my angular velocity linearly. So that's the same model that I've been using throughout the entire talk. Uh, what this allows me, us to do is to come up with uh, motion plans uh, that will move our robot you know, from a start position to an ending position uh, despite this uncertainty in wheel size. So again, these are four different wheel sizes. I'm trying to move it from the same starting position to a goal position that's right in that uh, far right corner. Some of you will notice this is a lobby of CSL upstairs. And then I switch out the tires to a new tire. The robot has no idea what uh, tires it has on it because it's always executing the same um, 
motion path. It's just uh, the path looks different um, because it has different size wheels. And so again, now with uh, the nominal size wheels, it goes to its desired position. Um, again, this is robust to plus or minus 20% uncertainty. Um, so this is a, a new way to look at you know, dealing with uh, uncertain systems. So here's with the third set of wheels. You know, again, you know, the path looks slightly different um, because of the wheel size, but I still come back to the desired ending position. So this allows us to do point-to-point -point control uh, even with you know, large but bounded uncertainty. And here it is with the, the final wheel size. The video is slightly sped up. I can't change for tires that fast. <laughs> Here, this is uh, actual data from uh, a camera that's observing the robots. There are five runs for each of those. Um, so again, this is uh, what should have happened. These are the paths um, that would take without any noise um, uh, for the four wheel sizes. And then uh, these are the paths for five, five trials of each of these wheel sizes, uh, moving uh, a little over four meters uh, in the X direction, two meters in the Y direction. Um, so there's a, you know, a wide range of future topics. Uh, we've shown that it's possible to control uh, these systems, that they are controllable. We haven't said anything about optimal control. Uh, we've shown that we have open loop paths, but we have not shown any results yet for feedback policies in the presence of noise. Uh, and various other real world applications in robotics. Uh, again, what I want you to go home with is that uh, this is uh, a useful way. You know, when you have bounded uncertainty, uh, we can move uh, the problems of this uncertainty into the path planning part, um, and which allows us to steer this. Uh, instead of an one, one system with an uncertain parameter, we think about steering the entire continuum of systems. Uh, I do want to thank my colleagues, a bunch of them in a row back there. And I'd like to open up for any questions. Yeah, I have a question. These <coughs> in the system, uh, can you also see them as uncertain initial conditions? And more, yeah, so your system is uncertain right now, right? It mm -hmm. has some uncertain parameter. Yeah. On the other hand, I, ha I see a modeling uh, framework where I see Un, uh, uncertainty in the initial condition, but around mm -hmm. some average system, and propagate yeah. those set of initial conditions. Mm -hmm. So, have you compared uh, your work with that kind of approach, or? Uh, let me answer you know, one part of that, because that's, that's an exciting area to look into. So there are certain uh, initial conditions, if you can parameterize those by an epsilon value, uh, and then show that it's controllable um, through the uh, Liebrecht analysis, it can generate arbitrary powers of epsilon. Uh, then there are certain initial disturbances uh, which are fully controllable. Yeah, what initial disturbances or disturbances? Uh, in what? So, you know, if I have, so if I can parameterize, for instance, um, so here we have an ensemble of robots um, where the initial condition uh, for the ensemble is disturbed according to that uh, epsilon value. Uh, and I can give them a command uh, and steer them from an initial condition to uh, you know, an ending condition that's parameterized by epsilon. Um, now if the you know, initial disturbance, if the initial conditions cannot be parameterized by that epsilon, then it's very possible that it's not. arbitrary values of your epsilon and and if you have control vector fields that, you know, that, that span that space, uh, then you can approximate any desired vector fields. Can you tell me the paper where they've done that? Uh, yes I can. I I can give you a whole list of those. Okay. I'd like to direct you to our own paper too, which all has that list in it.
infinite dimensional problem is because um, that continuum has every value of epsilon between you know, one minus delta to one plus delta. So we weren't just steering uh, four different wheel types uh, from the start to go. We were steering every wheel type between 80% and 120%. So that's the definition of a, a continuum. So if, if there's no noise in our system, then the ending error is just parameterized by how well that Taylor series approximation fits the actual value. Uh, and so the Taylor series appro you know, approximation um, has you know, decreasing error with the number, you know, the size of the series. And so we show the one-to-one uh, -one -one correspondence between that series uh, and the number of primitives. Uncertainty is less than, than unity, uh, then that uh, is always the 